Alito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. A little Choctaw first grader from Hugo, Oklahoma, named Fala, tells her teacher of the abuse she witnesses and experiences at home. The teacher reports the incident to law enforcement and to Child Protection Services, who then both conduct separate investigations, as little Fala has to repeat multiple times the trauma she has encountered. Repeating it is almost like reliving it time and time again. To make matters worse, the courage she once had to come forward to share about her terrifying world turns to fear as her family isn't prosecuted. After being passed between foster homes over a six-month period, she's then placed back into the home of her perpetrators. Not only does she not receive the emotional and psychological support she needs to work through her trauma and to begin to heal, she is victimized many times throughout her life. Fala turns to drugs at age 13 and shows signs of violence towards others, and so the cycle continues. Unfortunately, Fala's journey is similar to many others. There has to be a better way, and there is. Choctaw Nation's coordinated response to child maltreatment is not new. However, it is still somewhat rare. Today, we'll talk about how Choctaw Nation is taking the antiquated scenario of poor service coordination and tribal response to child maltreatment via their leading multidisciplinary team, which is the first tribal MDT in the state of Oklahoma. Listeners, I'd like to introduce you to Gina South and Carrie Hurst from Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Ladies, welcome to Native Choc Talk. Thank you. Yako Key. Yako Key. So a bit about you both. Gina M. South is Choctaw and is the Juvenile Division Chief and Assistant Prosecuting Attorney for the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Mrs. South is a member of the Alabama Bar Association, the State Bar of Texas, and the Choctaw Nation Bar. Previously, she has served as a member of the Volunteer Lawyers Association of Alabama, the State Director for the Alabama Network of Child Advocacy Centers, or ANCAC, a board member and trainer with the Native American Children's Alliance, and she is currently the newest member of the Board for the Children's Advocacy Centers of Oklahoma. In every capacity, Mrs. South works to ensure the safety of children and to improve her community's response to child maltreatment. And Carrie Hurst is the Choctaw Nation Multidisciplinary Team Coordinator with 10 years of experience in social services. We'll hear more about Carrie's role in just a moment. So many of us haven't heard about the multidisciplinary teams, otherwise known as MDT. So tell us about the basics of MDT. So I think it's a really complicated name for a very simple thing. Basically, you have all of the professionals that would respond to abuse who are coming together in one place at what time at one time, and they are reviewing that case of whatever it was that happened, whatever the crime was that a child was involved in somehow, either they were a witness to a crime or they were involved in the crime. And initially the very first thing that has to happen is that a crime is reported to the police. And so you're going to see law enforcement representatives, you'll see therapists, you'll see investigators, a forensic interviewer, um, sometimes medical professionals, social services, all of these people come together to decide what is the next step we need to take. And so the goals that we want to accomplish through the multidisciplinary team are that we want to reduce trauma, we want to promote successful legal intervention, like sometimes that's prosecution, um, and we want to ensure that the appropriate services are offered to the family and that we follow up with that case for that family. We don't want any cases to fall through the cracks. Absolutely. And just hearing that, much less what you listeners will hear throughout the rest of this episode, is that this is very different than the way Fala, in our example, was treated during her whole experience. And I know that it's it's 
not intentional to drag these kids through this terrible experience, but there is a better way. And I'm hoping that more and more tribes and, you know, just our local law enforcement will kind of catch on to what y'all are doing here. It's, it's pretty revolutionary in my mind, um, just because I've, I've seen some of this stuff from what my mom used to do. So Carrie, what are the benefits? How are multidisciplinary teams helping? They are providing safer outcomes for communities. Um, we respond in a culturally appropriate manner to reduce trauma to not only children, but families as well. Um, and the hope is to build stronger families and to honor, honor the legacy of Native people. The culturally appropriate manner. Can you give us some examples about what that might mean? culture is going to come into play. I mean, I believe culture is all throughout all of it, but two very specific times. And the first would be during the investigation stage. And sometimes um, very deeply acculturated Native people will have a somewhat different lifestyle than the people around them. And that's typically for cultural reasons. For example, you will often see in a Native household multiple generations under one roof. And during the investigation stage, the way this is reflected back to us is that in the prosecution office, we receive a report from a police officer and it might say a number of people live in the home or it might say, um, specify that various relatives come and go from the home at multiple times. And the way that that's written um, will vary or can vary if someone understands Native culture and understands that multiple generations live together in one household, then they're going to be more careful with how they present that in the investigation stage. And they'll explain the grandmother, grandfather, the cousin, you know, other relatives are living in the home. Whereas yeah. um, a lot of times during investigations into drug situations, they'll talk about just a lot of strangers live here, or different people, and they don't have all the names of all of the people who live there. So that's one stage yeah. where it would be important in investigation. <laughs> Another example is with the treatment stage um, or outcomes. And so in the treatment stage, there are a lot of cultural practices that are healing that a lot of Native people still engage in those healing practices. And so our hope is that all of our therapists are going to be aware of the different things that are available to tribal members or people who want to take part in cultural ceremony as a way of overcoming their trauma. Wow. Again, this is very different from what we typically see in the non-Native world. So kudos to y'all for going that extra mile and trying to make sure that all aspects of this child's environment are taken into consideration. So another benefit is MDT can increase kids' access to um, mental health services, correct? That is correct. correct. Carrie, why don't you talk about that? So a lot of the advocacy centers that MDTs utilize have um, on-site therapy, um, crisis intervention, and long-term therapy. The ones that don't refer those services out, um, these, these are typically services that are at no cost to the families. So the the MDTs and the advocacy centers working together can make those referrals so that the parents um, and the children and whoever may need those mental health services can, can access them. Fantastic. So what are the cases in which Choctaw Nation's MDT program will step in to help? So pretty much anything that can result in a criminal prosecution. So you're looking at kidnapping, um, domestic violence, physical abuse, sexual abuse, extreme cases of neglect, and potential trafficking. All of this just makes my heart hurt, you know, that any child would have to suffer all of this. Um, so it, it, as I was talking to y'all last time, it really dawned on me that this isn't just a job you and this whole MDT team are out there helping with these really terrible environments that we may not even understand that are out there today. So what age group does MDT cover? Theoretically, all children between birth and 18. There are cases um, where you might have additional 
services offered beyond the age of 18. For example, if you have a 25 year old who is functioning at the age of say a seven or eight year old, that might be better handled through the Child Advocacy Center or the Family Justice Center and utilizing that MDT process instead of just a regular investigation that doesn't have the involvement of additional professionals. So where and when did MDT start? Um, the multidisciplinary team has been in place, that process has been in place in a lot of different areas. It's not just in investigations and um, through crimes that children are involved in. If you think about different hospitals that you might go to, if you're having a specific illness and a team of doctors comes in and they look at every organ of your body and every symptom that you're having, and they try to figure out how all of that works together and what the best way is to treat you, that's an example of a multidisciplinary team that comes together to solve a problem. And so this is a similar situation with multidisciplinary teams for us we're just talking about crimes that a child is a witness to or somehow involved in. But the whole process started with Bud Kramer in Alabama. And it was in the, I think the late 80s, um, early 90s, when a case that he was working on as a prosecutor, he realized that this was ridiculous for a child to have to go around to 10 different places and tell their story, getting re-traumatized every time right. they tell that story again. And he wanted one location where a child could go and a child could share their story, hopefully less often. The ideal would be one time that they share that whole story. And it's recorded. It's with a forensic interviewer. And since then, the MDT process back when he started it has spread across the United States as a way to investigate crimes and a way to treat children and families who are healing. Hmm. Yeah. And it's something I had not heard of and it just seems brilliant to me, but it also seems like maybe this should have been put in place many, many years ago, but hopefully more and more facilities are starting to get a hold of this idea um, speaking of, who else out there does utilize MDT programming, do you know? So the exciting thing about multidisciplinary teams and about children's advocacy centers is that this is a movement that is spread across the United States. Like I said, it started in Alabama, it spread out across the United States from there. I think the first family justice center was in California. Um, so we had that aspect of it that started there, but it's gone international. And so wow. every year they have the International Symposium on Child Abuse in Huntsville, Alabama. And so we were very honored to be able to present at that this year. But you have people coming in from countries all over the world to get training on how to utilize the MDT process so that they can best respond to the needs of victims. I think it's also interesting just to see where the funding for MDT comes from. Sources like the Bureau of Indian Affairs of Justice Services, multiple DOJ sources, the National Children's Alliance, the National Native Children's Trauma Center, and others. Uh, so it's pretty interesting to see how the, the tribes are coming together for our Native children, and that's fantastic. So to give us a clear picture of how MDTs work, let's start at the beginning. Let's say amongst our Choctaw people, there's an allegation of child abuse or neglect. And then what happens next? There's one thing that I'd like to specify as we're looking at that, and that is that the crime has to happen within the jurisdiction of Choctaw Nation. And okay. so that's an important part of it. So if we take a child who has encountered some kind of a crime within the jurisdiction of Choctaw Nation, and then, Carrie, you can talk about what happens next. So either law enforcement or ICW gets that information, and then they will coordinate with each other before ever making contact with that family. They will get together. They will share the details that have been alleged, and um, they will begin to set up services such as a forensic interview. So at some point, they will go and make contact with that family. If there is a non-offending parent, that parent may accompany the child to the Family Justice Center or the Advocacy Center. If there is not a non-offending 
parent, then they will work with the family to identify somebody that can come and accompany that child. I just wanted to say a note on that, that one of the policies of Children's Advocacy Centers and our Family Justice Center is that someone who is accused of a crime cannot come to that location. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but that's why Carrie specified in her example that it has to be the non-offending parent who drives the child to the center because we know that children will not disclose abuse if they do not feel safe. And so if the parent who did something to them drives them to that location, most of the time they're probably coaching them along the way, you know, don't you talk about what happened, don't tell anyone. Um, So we want everyone to feel safe at a family justice center or at a children's advocacy center. And so that's why we can't have anyone who is accused to be on the premises. And that is such an important factor. It's something I hadn't thought of, but yeah, there's probably a lot of coaching going on. And even that whole don't shame the family or are you sure this really happened? Or, I mean, parents can unknowingly hurt the whole situation, even if they have the best of intentions, I'm sure. So once the family arrives at the advocacy center or the family justice center, they will immediately meet with an advocate who will help walk them through what is going to happen, the ins and the outs of the interview, and the child will be taken back for a forensic interview. While that child is being talked to by the interviewer, the advocate will be with the family um, assessing needs, working on starting service referrals. Um, and if the, the child discloses in the forensic interview, after it's over, there will be a kind of a team meeting where it's discussed what steps need to come next. Very thorough and very holistic. I remember you're telling me, Gina, that at one point you noticed there were all these separate parts, people with expertise that were helping a child, but a person may not have known how to navigate that system. And one of my takeaways while learning about MDT was that it seems there's a more holistic approach to helping the child and the family. So explain that further to us. So we do want it to be holistic and healing. And as Native people, I feel like the MDT approach is a very traditional Native concept in that we want to bring in everybody who has a piece of the story that can elaborate and can give us the most information so that we can approach all of the healing that needs to take place. Um, I think that it's really an approach that if people utilize it, and sometimes people don't utilize it, that if they do, then they can achieve a lot of healing and have a better outcome from being a victim of a crime. And I'll say that being a victim of a crime is a terrible experience. Anyone who has ever been victimized in any way knows. And if you just think about a situation maybe where your windows are hit out on your car or something like that, and the first thing you have to do is call the police. And then you're going to have to make sure you've got insurance and make sure that that's covered. And then you have to start making phone calls. And it takes time out of your work schedule when you're a victim that you lose time at work. And it takes time out of your bank account because you're having to pay for co-pays and doctor bills and right. um, all kind, all of the things that go along with being a victim that nobody signs up to be a victim. Nobody asks for it. It's something that unfortunately happens in the world that we live in. Anyone is at risk of becoming a victim. And so we don't wanna treat our victims as though they are the ones who are criminals, but oftentimes that is what happens. What we wanna do is do that that differently and help them have everything they need, all the information in one place so that they can get all of that information and make being a victim a little bit easier. This is a job, but it's so much more than a job, right? I mean, the fact that you're doing this great work for these kids and these families too, because the families are sometimes victims as well. And I know that you've talked before about how there are reps from law enforcement, medical representation, prosecution, behavioral health, forensic interviews, therapists, and victims advocates, and many more. But I wanted to learn more about victims advocates. Tell us about that. So a victim's advocate should provide support to the victim and the family at every turn. 
Okay. So it should start the moment they, they begin their MDT involvement. That victim advocate, like I said, should be assessing needs. Are the, is this family food secure? Do they have mm-hmm. rent money next month? Do we have birth certificates and CDIB cards, tribal membership? So while they're working through the issues at hand, they will also help to address those needs and to make service referrals for anything that the family may need. In addition, when this case is prosecuted, they will be with that family through every prosecutor meeting, every hearing, they will attend court with the families. That is, that will be their one constant in a world that's kind of unsure sometimes. Right. God bless those victim advocates. So Carrie, your role really is multifaceted. I see you as sort of a a hub among all these different moving parts. Explain what your world looks like when it comes to all of these facets. My world looks different every day. (laughs) Um, So not only do I coordinate and provide service and support to Choctaw Nation departments, I also am the coordinator for those departments and their state counterparts. So I coordinate a lot between our law enforcement and DHS. Um, I assist with all the coordinations between our law enforcement and and the Children's Advocacy Centers. I am always available to problem solve, troubleshoot, bring a different perspective to whatever the difficulty or complication may be and to always assist whoever may need help with assistance in locating additional services for the families. So how many hours of sleep do you get? Do you get sleep? Do you, are you on your phone 24 seven? I am on my phone a lot. <laughs> I bet Carrie you works are. really hard. She's oh, one of our Carrie. hardest workers. God bless you. Yeah. That sounds like a lot. Um, and seriously though, are you getting calls like at eight o'clock at night and that kind of thing or, or no, if I'm getting a call that late at night, there's an emergency and there's a reason to call me. Um, my team is very respectful of my time at home with my family. And so if there is a, an emergency, then they know they can, like, if something has to happen right now, they can reach out to me. If it can wait till in the morning, they typically will choose that route. But yeah. I do try to be as available as I can. Mm-hmm. Well, so when it's vacation time, I hope you really do put it all away and do your thing. Everybody needs to be rejuvenated, especially when you're doing such important work. So so since prosecution is part of this process, Choctaw Nation has criminal jurisdiction, and we also have law enforcement to back up that jurisdiction, correct? Yes, that is correct. And mm-hmm. so what you'll see across Choctaw Nation is that we have our own tribal law enforcement, and that is a wonderful thing that we have access to that. And then in addition to that, we have a number of officers at every single um, police unit throughout Choctaw Nation, You know, whether it's a local city or whether it is the county, whatever it is, um, we have officers that are cross-commissioned. And so when an officer is cross-commissioned, it means they can act as though they are tribal police. Oh, okay. So we're in the Choctaw districts and uh, a non-native or non-Choctaw citizen is a policeman and he can can kind of bridge that gap where needed. Is that how it works? Yes. When they're cross-commissioned, they are allowed to respond to that incident and they're allowed to take the report and send it into prosecution for charges. And I think that's a misconception because mm-hmm. of how the state has approached the jurisdictional changes after McGirt. Um, the a lot of the different agencies have been instructed. You may go out and respond, but you can't do anything beyond that, beyond calling tribal law enforcement, telling them to come on out and take care of the situation. Um, So that's a really frustrating thing when we have that situation arise, because I know law enforcement wants to be able to help. And so for them to receive that instruction from their leadership is very frustrating. But here in Oklahoma, we know where that's coming from. 
And um, we know yes, that that's not what is best for all Oklahomans because everyone who lives here is an Oklahoman and we all have access to all of those services. But because the tribe actually has the ability to prosecute crimes and govern itself, then we want to also have our own tribal law enforcement. And so that's why they're there to be able to respond to those instances. And throughout opening, um, throughout the process of opening the Children's Advocacy Center and the Family Justice Center, our goal is to be able to serve all of the community that needs our assistance. There are some programs that we have that are limited only to tribal members, but anyone who's a victim of a crime can come to our Family Justice Center or can go to any child advocacy center and they can re they're can they eligible to receive those services. They, they don't just access those services by walking in the door though. They have to be referred by police or by ICW oh. to be able to access the services. So if somebody okay. is saying, you know, I think my child was abused, what do I do? You don't just call the Child Advocacy Center, you call the police because everything starts with the police report. Okay, good so, to know. Always police first. So listeners, that is an important conversation if you are Choctaw and in the Choctaw districts that that's the that's the method to go. You call the police first and then they'll take it from there. And again, with when you see all the stuff going in the on the background, the victims advocates and all the different moving parts, there has to be that one place to get the information logged and and the police know what's happening and then they get passed out to the right person from there. So I've talked in this podcast multiple times about McGirt versus Oklahoma. You mentioned that earlier as well, Gina, in which a case was taken to the Supreme Court. Mr. McGirt had committed a crime on native land and was tried by the state of Oklahoma. But due to the original laws that had never been carried out, not just in, in this case, Mr. McGirt should have been tried in federal and not state court. The Supreme Court decision was a game changer, ensuring that American Indians would be tried on a federal level. But little did I know the Sizemore decision was actually the major game changer here. That Sizemore as in Devin Warren Sizemore, by the way. So Gina, tell us more about the Sizemore case and what it had to do with our tribal jurisdiction. Well, Sizemore was the one for Choctaw Nation, and that was the case that we were waiting for and that we needed mm -hmm. in order for us to be able to exercise our jurisdiction. Because after McGirt came down and we saw how it was applied and that it was going to state to all the leaders of Oklahoma, okay, this tribe is allowed to prosecute crimes. They have tribal sovereignty. They are allowed to govern themselves and they can act as a true government in prosecuting crimes. And so Sizemore was very similar in that it said the boundaries of Choctaw Nation were never disestablished, meaning the boundaries of Choctaw Nation were in place as to those jurisdictional lines where we can prosecute crimes within Choctaw Nation. And that's really what Sizemore did is that it was specific to Choctaw Nation and it gave us the ability well, we always had the ability, um, but it, Oklahoma exercised that ability in place of the tribes doing it. And so what the Supreme Court decision said was that tribes, you actually are supposed to be prosecuting these crimes, and we want to give you the right to be able to do that. So again, that was, I, I knew very little about Sizemore and how it actually, you know, for us, that that's the Choctaw side of things. And I think everybody knows about McGirt, but this was good education for me and probably for, for some others. So thanks for sharing about that. So the tribe's legal departments have been drinking from a fire hose since then. So tell us about the aftermath of that decision. So the only way I can tell you about the aftermath is to tell you about the days before, that they were days that were filled with us creating lists and calling around to different agencies and finding out um, who had who hadn't been prosecuted yet, or you know what were the cases that were likely going to come to us. And then the morning that that decision came out as to Sizemore, it was like somebody blew a trumpet and said go, and everyone took off wow. running. Um, we had boxes and boxes of cases that were 
suddenly turned over to us and sent to us. And because we had gathered as much information as we could, we were able on that first day to go ahead and start filing in the Choctaw Nation District Court cases that were eligible for prosecution through Choctaw Nation. And so it was really important to us that there was no gap in services for people and that there wasn't gonna be any situation where it was a criminal free for all, where you could go to Indian country and start committing crimes or that all of the people who were uh, native were suddenly let out of prison, even if they're dangerous. You know, We took measures that could be taken to make sure everyone was going to be as safe as possible. I just had to raise my hand on that one because I have heard that before too. I've seen it on Facebook and um, even in, you know, some upper leadership folks saying that that is the case, that all these people went free and were let out of jail. And that's not the case at all. So I'm glad you're clearing that up for us as well. It's not the case. Um, I think that there are individual situations that for one reason or another, something happened, you know, that somebody was let out or that a, a case somewhere was overlooked. And n in my opinion, those are not intentional situations, but there was no criminal free for all and there was no terrible effect. I mean, when you listen to the news reports from back then of what the state of Oklahoma was saying, it's so frustrating because as native people, we are Oklahomans and we want everyone to be safe. And so we took every precaution that we could to make sure that there was gonna be no gap in services, that we would continue to have prosecutions um, for anything that was committed within Choctaw's jurisdiction. Absolutely. So to tie it all together, how does this tie in, you know, this, this Supreme Court decision tie into MDT? The way it all ties in together is that anytime there is a child who is exposed to some crime, whether they were uh, sitting on the sofa and their parents got into an altercation and the police had to be called, that child is now a witness to a crime. And so we want to get that child's statement. Um, we also want to make sure that that child has access to therapy if they need therapy from that. And so unfortunately, there are a number of crimes that children can either be a part of or be a witness to. And so giving Choctaw Nation that jurisdiction and that ability back to be able to prosecute those crimes, um, that is the thing that all came together for us to be able to have an MDT, because if we were not prosecuting anything, there wouldn't really be a big need for us to have a multidisciplinary team. So also you were hired by the tribe as assistant prosecutor in 2022, but let's go back a bit to the personal story you yourself have about MDT. I love this story. Well, I was hired by the tribe in 2020. Um, so that is about the time that all of the cases started coming through. So the tribe initially put out a request. They knew they would need more prosecutors. So uh, I had been watching since I'm Choctaw and I lived in the area. I'd been watching to see when jobs were posted. So I was so excited when I saw that one came open. But it was during my first, probably my first month, I overheard this conversation in the hall um, between some of our upper level management. And they were saying, well, you know, these crimes happen, our code states that we do have to have a multidisciplinary team in place to investigate the crime. And <laughs> because of my history and because of my background, my work experience, I mean, my ears perked up when I heard them say MDT and I came tearing out of my office and I said, did you say MDT? <laughs> and I said, please, can I be involved in that? Because I know how to do this. And just to give you a little bit of that backstory, it was probably in 2012 when I was living in Alabama and I was working as the state director at the Alabama Network of Children's Advocacy Centers. I had just learned about all of the best practices, ways to address child maltreatment. And I was sitting there looking at a picture, looking at a map, and I thought, I wish my tribe had this. I wish mm -hmm. Choctaw Nation and the kids of Choctaw Nation had access to 
all of these types of therapy in that multidisciplinary process where the crimes could be investigated in the right way. And so, you know, that wish that I had, it has come true. And I'm so happy that we were able to um, bring all of the right agencies together, all of the right people within Shock Nation together. And there is a great team that is very committed to each other and committing to the safety. They're committed to the safety of children um, to ensure that everything is investigated properly and that people get the treatment they need. I just, I can't imagine a better fit. And I feel like it was divine intervention for you to hear that conversation. And then your background back when you were in Alabama and knowing about MBTs, it, it couldn't have been a better match. So that's pretty neat. Pretty neat. <laughs> it was Somebody exciting. Was out for these kids, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So going back to when, you know, you've been helping this child and there typically is a need to prosecute. So let's say at some point it's determined there's a need to prosecute. What happens then at that point? So if we do have a need to prosecute, then there's going to be a lot of waiting time at the very beginning because there are so many hearings before you can actually go to the real trial itself. Like there are preliminary hearings. There are um, just, it's a long process. And so before a case is prosecuted, you'll probably have, if you're the victim or if a child is a victim, they'll be contacted by their victim advocate and um, notified of any court dates that are coming up, or they can call the victim advocate and find out what court dates are coming up. And they can also call their victim advocate and find out um, about the crime victims compensation fund, and they can get that phone number so that they can file to be compensated for um, expenses they've had as a victim or um, anything that they, like if they miss time from work, then, and they right. can prove that, then they can be reimbursed for those things, those extra costs that are associated with being a victim. So there is a long waiting period before you actually get to the trial, but it is a time that's pretty busy because the attorneys are working behind the scenes and the investigators are sometimes still working at that point as well, gathering more information. So additionally, a child in the family or whichever party may also meet with prosecutors and the victim advocate and have a discussion about what trial will look like and what they can expect. Okay. So what other areas does your department also cover? So here in the Office of Prosecution, anything related to any crime, it could be um, a larceny, robbery, burglary, it could be a rape case, it could be traffic tickets, wildlife infractions, just about anything. But in addition to that, we also handle the legal side of tribal custody. So in the Children and Family Services Department, they have the social workers who oversee the children who are taken into tribal custody for those deprived cases. And on our side in the Office of Prosecution, we handle the legal part of those deprived cases and um, the delinquency cases as well. And we make sure that the families are offered all of the services that are available. Fantastic. And so to paint an even clearer picture, Tell us what the old system looked like, that disparate way of, of doing things before MDT became a program at Choctaw Nation. So before the multidisciplinary team, everyone did operate in a silo. It was just this host of services and you could get your, um, you could get online and you could go into the website and you could see all the different services that were offered. But every single program most of them are grant funded. And so they all have different requirements. Like mm, this one, yeah. you can apply into this program to receive this if you have these different things, like you live within this area or you know whatever the situation may be. There are limitations to each of those programs. And our hope with bringing it all together for the multidisciplinary team is that everyone's going to have additional knowledge of what those programs are so that we can refer people to the specific services that will help them most. Because I know when I'm reading on the Choctaw message boards and people are talking about um, things that they've experienced and sometimes they're having to call up to the headquarters, there are people that will 
get past, you know, from number to number and they feel like they're caught in a loop or they sometimes they feel like they're not getting the answers that they're looking for. And our hope is with the, the Family Justice Center, people will get answers and they will get contact information where they can get those services. So I hear that this program is top of the line and is results and evidence based. And this is also an accredited program, correct? That is correct. Our MDT is a member of the National Children's Alliance, and we're also members of the Children's Advocacy Centers of Oklahoma. Fantastic. And then, you know, I said, um, you know, when we talk about uh, results and evidence-based, how do you measure success? There are different ways to measure success. And I'm going to give you an overall answer that is, I look to the seventh generation principle that our actions today, are they making a difference for the seventh generation? Because each one of us is more connected to the other generations that are before and after us than we realize. If you put yourself in the middle, you can think three generations back and you might know the names of some of those great grandparents. Um, And then if you think of yourself again and think three generations forward, that's not that far into the future, that's relatively close. And so that's an expanse of seven generations that are touched by one person's actions or by the seventh generation prior to them. And so we want the actions that we're taking to make a difference and have a benefit into the seventh generation because we're always thinking about our most, one of our most valuable assets as a tribe Um, You know, the first is our elderly and the second is our children and the elderly are the greatest asset because they're the keepers of our history and our children are also our greatest asset because they're the keepers of our future. And so we want to prepare the future for them and set systems into place that will be able to serve them for years to come. So thinking about the bigger picture and not just the right here and now. Uh, And you have over a year's worth of data at this point, I would think, since you opened in April of 2022, correct? We do. And I got some statistics pulled and I can send those to you so that you can post those as part of it. Um, But it is very interesting to see um, all of the crimes that we've been able to file charges on and that we've been able to work towards a prosecution. Um, So that's exciting that we are helping achieve justice for people. Yeah. And and speaking of justice, why don't you share some of those success stories you've experienced thus far? So we had a teenager who made an outcry of abuse. Um, Law enforcement was contacted first and they brought ICW in. We immediately initiated child advocacy center services. We had the the family scene at an advocacy center that day and a forensic interview was conducted where the child disclosed to abuse. The child was immediately referred to therapy. Mom herself was referred to therapy and received an advocate. Um, They are both continuing services. The tribe filed charges on this stepfather and the the feds also indicted him so wow that's great and you have to you have to look at you know how much you guys put into this with your mdt teams and how that's part of that success that really does reflect a lot of man hours of work from different people and that's just one situation one scenario that she's describing that there are a handful of cases that have that exact same descriptor, that same set of facts. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we have dozens and dozens of cases where there's a child victim that because we were using the MDT process, we were able to get that child a forensic interview during within um, probably a week. Ideally, a child is going to have a forensic interview the same day that something happens. That's not always possible. If we can do it within the next three days, that's better. Um, So that's our goal is to always be striving towards quick investigations that are thorough at the very beginning, rather than something happening and then finding out we need to go back and gather additional information. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. But I just want to stress how many of these cases there are. I mean, it's, 
it's really sad that it's happening, that child abuse and child neglect know no boundaries at all. And they cross every boundary, whether we're talking about ethnicity or race or class or you know, family finances, anyone can experience being a victim of child abuse or child neglect. Yes, ma'am. And I, I've just out of curiosity, you know, MMIW, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women, or MMIP, which is people, um, I know that there is a Choctaw group uh, for MMIW there at Choctaw Nation. Do you tie in with them at all? So like I've, young, young women or anything like that? Yes, I follow them on Facebook. I stay current with what's going on. I've tried to make it to several of the meetings, but it was usually during some of our court hearings that I had to appear for. Yeah. Um, but I'm so thankful that we have this group of women that are coming together and speaking up because that's how change is made, is by Native women coming together and talking about a problem and saying we have to address this issue. And so I, we do, our office participates in um, the MMIW days that we have here at headquarters. And um, we do everything that we can to support that mission because it's something that we really feel strongly about and we believe in. And on the practical side of things, we are the ones who are handling those cases. <laughs> so oh, if right. we... Right. If we have a child in custody, whether they're a delinquent or whether they're a deprived child, if that child runs away from the location where they are, then that child becomes that statistic of MMIP or MMIW. And so we want to make sure that we get them back as quick as we can so that they don't remain a statistic. So uh -huh. that's what we're always trying to make sure that we prevent those things from happening when it's possible, but that we have a quick response when it does happen. Absolutely. Um, you know, what I'm about to talk about next can be a bit of a sensitive topic. Do you feel that there are sometimes more challenges about being Native when it comes to these kids that are needing help? Absolutely, I do. Um, I think that being Native, it's a beautiful thing that adds so much um, benefit and structure and context to my life that I'm so thankful that this is who I am and that this is the family that I was born into. You know, we don't get to pick that, but right. it makes me sad for the situations where I'll hear someone say, well, we called 911 and they asked us if we were Native and if we were, they weren't going to come out and help us. And that is tragic because right. everyone who's in Oklahoma and part of the state deserves to be able to access a 911 phone call. And those situations are rare that I hear about, but I know that there are preconceived notions and, you know, judgments and generalities that people will assume about Native people that affect how they write their reports or will affect how they view a situation. And so I think that being Native, while it is wonderful and a blessing, and I'm so very thankful for it, um, I think that there are hurdles, extra hurdles that we have to jump because of those misconceptions that people have. The other part of it is really that jurisdictional component where um, people aren't wanting to provide all of the services that could be provided. I do think it's important to remember, you know, throughout history, tribes have not always been able to agree on what is best or what the best best path is for everyone. Um, each tribe individually makes those decisions. And so that's why you'll see, you know, the Cherokee or the Chickasaw, they're going to handle their approach to their jurisdiction in a different way. And those other smaller tribes, they may not even have a jurisdictional um, base right. that they can operate from. And so it makes people, I think, puts them in a confusing situation when they're trying to decide, well, does my tribe even have jurisdiction? What land am I on? You know, it matters where that crime takes place. And you want someone to respond if you're a victim. And so that's what we're trying to do here at Choctaw Nation. Just because we've chosen to go ahead and exercise our criminal jurisdiction and our sovereignty and our ability to prosecute doesn't mean that every single tribe in Oklahoma sure. is doing the same thing. 
Very true. And I think what is beautiful about this is that many tribes over the years, it's been passed down to not talk, don't speak your language, don't share about your anything having to do with the tribe, whether it's the culture or much less something terrible, like maybe there's incest going on among a certain family or, you know, whatever the case is. And for Choctaw people to be able to go to Choctaw Nation and get the help they need and not have to feel like, yeah, they can make that one 911 call, but from there, they'll be taken care of by their own tribe. I think and that I it's so important as a tribe, we're the extended family of each other. And so it's so important as a tribe for us to actually come together and assist those members of us who are hurting and who need help. That's a very native traditional concept. And it's something we should still be doing today. Agreed. <laughs> but when I think about the people that are doing the jobs in MDT, I cannot even imagine how hard it is what these experts and these people who are helping the kids do. This can't be an easy job. I mean, you kind of have to play um gentle and loving and yet on the other hand you got to stand up for what's right you got to help the kids but prosecute the people the perpetrators so what challenges do you think they face when it comes to helping these kids I think that the biggest challenge that they face um and I think there are multiple departments or agencies that will tell you the same thing is a lack of understanding or a difference in interpretation between mm -hmm. what each department what program, what role everybody is supposed to play and what their limitations are. And I think another huge one is secondary trauma. So the, these social workers, these law enforcement agents, um, the prosecutors, even reading the reports, the advocates, most of them have families at home. You run into a family that, that reminds you of your own. Um, you see people in their absolute worst moments of life and you have to remain stoic and make decisions for that family. And so that takes a toll on, on your own well-being and your own mental health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And even the strongest of people who maybe have been to therapy themselves will still have a day where it's got to be, get to them after a while. So really appreciate those folks and what they're doing. So what's next for this program? The Ani Family Justice Center in Durant will open fall of 2023. Yay! We are close. We are working hard and diligently every single day to make that happen as quickly as possible. The Ani House Child Advocacy Center in Hugo will open late 2023, possibly early 2024. And so we will have two sites where tribal members, where all children actually can access these kinds of services. That's fantastic. Well, and speaking of who is eligible, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Who is eligible to be helped by Choctaw Nation's MDT program? So it gets a little funny with jurisdictional things. However, I am a firm believer in we turn no child away. So there may be some additional coordination that needs to handle be handled if it is a non-native family. Okay. But being non-native will not disqualify anyone from our services. That's amazing. Choctaw Nation doing big things. <laughs> we want to be those good partners. <laughs> That's right. Definitely. So switching gears just a little bit. Now, you know, I can't help but ask this question, Gina, what interesting stories do you have to share with us about your own ancestors? <laughs> well, I'm so very proud of my Choctaw ancestors. I can trace back to William and Lily Monroe, who lived in Mississippi, and they were the ones that came over. Um, they had Milton Monroe, and Milton Monroe is my great-grandfather. And he married um, Winnie Hill, and her last name had been Hillatubby, so it was shortened to Hill. But Milton and Winnie had Etta and Ella, and Ella is my grandmother. And Etta and Ella, when they were little girls, they went to boarding school. And I know that they started at Tuscahoma, and they were there when it burned. And um, my grandma has, had, she would talk about going to stay with other families and then not knowing where her sister was. 
and oh. being worried about her in that fire because they had to put all of the girls somewhere. So there were homes in the area that took them in. Um, but after that, they ended up going to Shilako. And um, I just, I think that being a boarding school survivor was not a phrase that my grandma ever would have said or thought because she did love school. There are only one or two things that I know about that were bad, although I know the experience must have been bad because her sister, Etta, never spoke of what happened to her family. And so we don't wow. have any stories from there. So children in one family could either have a positive experience or a negative experience um, either way. But I know that my grandma was always encouraging me to get more education. And so I know that she believed in school and I know I'm thankful that she always encouraged me to study more, to read more. She would buy me any book I asked for. Um, she was, they're just wonderful people. So very kind and generous and gracious. And um, I, I just love everything that I'm able to find out about them and everything that other people can tell me about them as well. I love that. Well, you know, that's right up my alley as well. <laughs> so that Monroe family that came over from Mississippi, do you have photos of them by any crazy chance? I don't have William and Lily. I wish that I did, but I do have a picture of Milton and Winnie and it's a beautiful picture. So I'm going to get that to you. Um, and I'll send some pictures of my grandma and her sister and yes. other relatives and family members. Those pictures are from the forties, um, the 1940s, but love it. There, well, there's I, some old pictures. I, and I know that our listeners love looking at the photos. I do too. So um, yeah, and I, I think it's a great way for us to also pay tribute to your ancestors who came all the way here from Mississippi. Yeah. So that's <laughs> wonderful. And isn't that interesting about the boarding school? So you have two sisters. One has more of a positive, oh, I learned a lot and all that. She may have also been holding back about some of the negative sides of that, or maybe not, maybe she had a great experience. My great grandmother well, was the same way, but she really? also, yeah, she went, she only went for a year or two to a boarding school in New Mexico. But, um, when she would talk about it, she said, I got to be around other people that look like me because she was living with a white guardian family and they were abusing the the people they were had guardianship over, including my great grandmother, but same thing where, I always wondered, was it really that great or was it great compared to the fact that you were away <laughs> from your white guardians? I don't know. <laughs> but so Edna and Ella, again, my great grandmother's name was Ella as well. So oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Good name. Um, yeah. It is. I I really think that those generations were conditioned to be more accepting and to be more tolerant because that was how they stayed alive. And yes. that's what gave them the perseverance that got us here today was by them being kind and by them being, um, I guess, tolerant of all of the different government programs that were imposed upon them that they had no choice about. That what I right. see in my ancestors and my family that they chose to look at the positive mm -hmm. and they chose to only talk about the good things as opposed to focusing on the negative. And so that's a, a good lesson for me, something that I try to do. <laughs> Amen. And that's the Choctaw way too, I feel. There's kind of this positivity about, yeah, you do have to face reality, but you also can look forward and be positive and uh, all that. So wouldn't they be amazed, our ancestors, that there's actually victim advocates and there's this whole team that comes together to help kids that was a very different experience than our grandparents had, great grandparents and all that. So, Absolutely. Oh, I wish I wish they we could bring them back here to a different time so they could see oh. how far things have come. <laughs> and see, I feel like they are our cloud of witnesses, and so I think that they know, and I like to think that they they were making them proud. Amen. Well, I'd also like to mention a shameless plug about the ribbon skirts that you make, Gina. Tell us how people can see the good work you do and purchase your skirts. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, I have a site on Instagram and it's called Ayukli Yunish, beautiful buffalo. Buffaloes are my favorite animal because they <laughs> protect their young. They come together in a circle when they're threatened and they surround the younger and the more innocent ones of the tribe of the group 
And I believe that as a tribe, we should be that same way. Um, oh. But so Beautiful Buffalo is the name of it, Ayukli Yenish. And I will give you the link to the Instagram where people can go and click on that and see the different skirts that I've made so they can see an example of my work. But they can also look for me at the Labor Day Festival. I'll have a booth in the Arts and Crafts Center. Ooh. And that's where I'll be selling most of my work. So right now I'm not taking orders because I'm only sewing for the Labor Day Festival trying to get ready. Oh, man, your fingers <laughs> must be sore. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> That's wonderful. I recently saw a department that had every female had a ribbon skirt on. And I wondered if maybe someone bought from some from you there at Choctaw Nation. I can't remember what department it was. Well, I'll tell you, our department has done that. And we did that two years ago for Child Abuse Awareness Month. And so we all made ribbon skirts and I taught everybody how. And it was just a fun time for us all to get together and make those. And then we got some good pictures of our group afterwards. So that was really a special thing for us to do together. And I did want to say that my love for sewing and for anything related to craft, I know that it comes from my Native family and I know it comes from my grandma. She loved to draw. She taught me how to sew. She taught me how to knit, crochet, cross stitch, embroider, wow. all of those things that I know she learned at Indian school. And mm -hmm. um, I know that she was able to pass down that knowledge to me. I'm very thankful for that because I know that they taught them really good sewing skills. Oh my goodness. I didn't even think about that. What you're doing today is passed down from something that she learned when she was in a native boarding school. That's oh, right. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see your ribbon skirts. So I will be <laughs> sure to you. stop by your booth and check them out and see if I can awesome. grab one. <laughs> I will look for you. <laughs> that would be wonderful. So the work you guys are doing is, is truly God's work. Who knows how many lives you've you know, touched beyond even the victims themselves. And when victims reach out and are advocated for and their tribe protects and stands up for them, there's a greater chance for healing and for the circle of historical trauma to finally be broken. So thanks for all you're doing. So before we go, Gina, are there any words of wisdom you'd like to share with our listeners? So I want to say something that I think that my ancestors would have said, and that is to love God and love others work hard, do good, be compassionate and loving, accepting of all people and um, make the world a better place. I love that. Definitely. We'll take that to heart. Yakoki to both of you for being here with me today. God bless you and God bless the children of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Yakoki. Yakoki. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends.